Thank you. Good morning. Really excited about this panel. I'm not going to go into any detail describing it because you have the description of the panel, uh, hopefully, on the website and in front of your screens. Uh, the issue and the topic, I think, interests a lot of us. Uh, in as, uh, as an introduction would go, I think there are a number of definitions around big data, open data. But I was joking with John in the morning that um, this particular one is really quite endearing. It comes from uh, uh, somebody called Dan Arely. Uh, and I apologize in advance for any offense that this creates. But he says that big data is like teenage sex. Everybody talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. So everyone claims they're doing it as well. And I thought that that's an interesting introduction into this panel. Uh, the description, and I have asked the three speakers to uh, stick to some of those questions and help us understand and flesh out some of those questions, um, tries to problematize this phenomenon, this phrase, this idea, this innovation, uh, this thing called big data that we can't now escape from. It is much as the term would suggest all around us. And in particular, also because I come from a country, I'm, I'm from Sri Lanka, uh, I am extremely concerned and interested in the protection of the individual uh, and looking at big data from a human rights perspective, a rights-based perspective, which includes a gendered perspective as well. Uh, at its simplest, not taking as an assumption that big data is inherently good, uh, and looking at some of the value assumptions around the creation of big data. But that's as far as an introduction as I would like to give. We have three wonderful speakers who have had the opportunity over, I think, the past year almost, to interact over email, and some of you have known for much longer. Uh, John, again, I will not introduce all of them. Uh, you have their bios in front of you. May I just say that uh, in terms of selecting the speakers for this panel, the, the idea was to come at it from three different angles. John will give, uh, I think, one specific angle around big data through uh, certain products uh, and his own work, uh, his own significant work in this area. Anahi and Manu will uh, respond to some of those points but also bring in some of their experience and work as well. Manu from a more academic theoretical framework that helps us understand uh, some of the underlying fundamentals of big data. And Anahi, most interestingly, and I'm very thankful for her to being on this panel uh, from the perspective of also from Internews, uh, how this phenomenon of big data is inextricably entwined with communities on the ground and what it means for them as opposed to what it mean, might mean for us uh, at the upper echelons of big data production and consumption. So with that, John, I won't hold you back. Um, you have, I believe, a 10-minute presentation after which each of the respondents will speak for seven minutes. The idea is very much then to have a Q&A session for the rest of the time that we have allotted. And I believe Patrick has opened up questions on Twitter. So for our web audience, I encourage you both now and as the session proceed, uh, goes on ahead to send in your questions over Twitter. John? Um, thank you uh, for the great introduction. So <clears throat> what I, I think what we're going to talk about today is, is really about uh, the applications of, of big data in the context of humanitarian work and what that means for uh, changing the way people operate, et cetera. Um, so I called my talk the humanitarian face of big data, uh, and I'll talk a bit uh, about why uh, in a second. So my name is John Gosier. I, I run a company called D8A, um, or Data Group, and we make uh, tools and technologies that help uh, the civic sector governments, cities, make sense of uh, large amounts of data. So we help them with big data problems. Um, but one of the things that I, I've started to, to notice in talking to these organizations about data is people tend to conflate uh, a number of, of, of disparate ideas under, under one term, right? So they, we talk about data, but we're really talking about many different things. And uh, I, I liked your example earlier. Uh, 
the example of the, the high school thing where, you know, everyone's talking about it, but no one really knows what it's mean, what's, what's really going on. So uh, I, I just wanted to lay some groundwork, you know, about what data um, really means and what people are kind of tr hinting at when they talk about it. Um, so you have, uh, when you talk about data, people are, tend to talk about three specific types of data, right? So you have uh, what what's I call packet data, right? So when your ISP is sending your laptop information through fiber, um, that is a, a, a means of delivery for content, right? Um, and then you have uh, the over the airwaves when uh, a cell phone tower is sending you mobile data to your device. That That's one type of data, right? Uh, but then you have the content itself, media, binary files, video, et cetera. Those are also a type of data. Um, and then you have what's called metadata. Um, and these are ways of um, machine readable ways of describing that content. So applying um, uh, even the, the extensions, the file extensions that are used uh, to name files. That's a type of metadata. The timestamp, the author, the, the, the origin, that kind of thing. These are types of metadata. And when you think about data problems, um, they, they, they also tend to fall in kind of three areas. And so I'll talk about those for a bit. Um, I'm sure you've all heard this before. Big data tends to be uh, referred to as being the intersection of, of uh, velocity, volume, and um, varieties of information. And what that really means is you can have data problems that are, um, that are related to having too much, just too much content, um, or too much of any one of those three things we just talked about. Uh, you can also have uh, things coming at you too quickly, the velocity problem. Uh, you can also have uh, the variety problem. You have too many different types of data coming at you from too, uh, too many different sources. So when you think about big data problems, uh, well, when you think about data problems, they live in any one of these sectors or they can live in any two of these sectors. Uh, but when you think about big data, they, they these problems tend to live right at the center of that, right? They're a little bit velocity, a little bit volume, a little bit variety. Um, you can have big data problems that are completely separate. You can have just way too much content. But uh, when you think about it, if you take the types of data and you take the, 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 these uh, qualifications of problems, um, you start to notice that big data problems become uh, exponentially uh, complex and uh, problematic, uh, right? So you, you, can cr you can solve data problems by creating meta metadata, but when you create more metadata, you're creating more things to keep track of, and hence the, the process keeps going. So it, it exponentially uh, compounds on itself. So what does that mean for people in this room? Um, so, uh, so, you know, given that framework and thinking about ways of thinking about data and content, et cetera, uh, hopefully that informs some of the things that I'll talk about now, which are different ways of, a pro of uh, tackling uh, problems related to data and humanitarian response. So in this community, I, I kind of observe that there's three ways people tend to go about working with data or, or using data in their work, right? So they, they fall into three buckets, right? Uh, qualifying data, so making decisions based on, uh, qualifying decisions based on data that's been collected. Um, quantification, so just knowing the facts, the figures, the, the groundwork for making, um, uh, carrying out some activities, but not necessarily for making decisions. Um, and then the query, which I'll talk about in just a bit. Uh, so when it comes to, to the qualification of data, uh, just a couple of examples of projects that I've been working on over the past couple of years. Um, on the uh, right, you see a project we did with a company called GeoSprocket. I don't know if they're here, uh, but the thesis there was um, using sentiment analysis uh, and uh, means of extracting uh, values from a data set that weren't there to inform action as a result. Um, right now we're doing a pretty big project with the U.S. Army's uh, Wounded Warriors program where um, we're doing the same thing around veteran communities. Um, and then on the end you see a project we did with Thomson Reuters, same thing. All three of these projects represent a form of uh, predictive analytics. So you have data set, uh, in, the, in all three cases, um, 
Well, in two of the cases, it was Twitter uh, and social media. In the last case, the Thomson Reuters case, it was news articles. And um, you, you have the content, but what you're doing is you're extracting value out, you're adding that as metadata, and then you're using that to inform some new decision. Um, that, that decision to act on the data is the qualification, right? So the organization is saying that um, we have the su sufficient means, we have the confidence in the models and the algorithms, and we have uh, trust enough in the data set that we're now gonna make decisions as a result. Uh, when it comes to, to quantity, um, slightly different, slightly unrelated, um, but slight, slightly different use cases for, for quantity. So you have portals for just looking up information. Um, I give the example of aid data, um, um, data.un.gov, uh, and um, another project that we have called Statfrica. Uh, again, all of these are just for looking up information, the most basic form of, of capturing and uh, uh, essentially researching using data. Um, and then finally, we have the query. And I, I use this term to kind of refer to the way organizations ask questions about the world around them, uh, the communities that they're working in, or um, to get the, the public to participate in creating data sets that don't exist or sharing data sets that they can't find um, without the ask. Um, so I call this the query. This is where crowdsourcing comes in. Uh, we're doing a project now uh, in Congo where, um, so in, in Congo, you have all these organizations working, uh, these extractive mineral organizations working to uh, mine resources from, from the country. Um, and the truckers who carry that information back and forth, or carry those resources back and forth, are starting to communicate with one another to let each other know about um, you know, problematic routes, robbery, theft bribery um, so that they can do their jobs better. If you can capture that information and provide it to the people who are deploying them, they can help them make better decisions on a, on a larger scale. And so that's one of the, the projects that we're doing uh, with, under the methodology of what we call the query, where we're essentially asking them for their input and then helping direct them as a result. Um, and then on the end there, you see uh, the human face of big data, which is a, a project that we worked on last year with uh, author Rick Smolin, um, where he, he wanted to help organization, uh, sorry, he wanted to help the uh, general public make better sense of this kind of amorphous term, big data, and, and help relate it to their er everyday lives. So you'll notice a lot of the pictures that I used in this um, presentation all come from his book. Um, uh, and uh, actually another book called Strangers in the Light uh, that is also uh, looking at the way digital um, uh, devices are kind of changing um, everyday circumstances. Um, so when you think about data and you think about uh, all the different ways this applies in this industry, it's, it's really about how do, you, how do you more effectively carry out humanitarian work uh, while being informed by sometimes real-time um, data, sometimes it's, it's copious amounts of data, sometimes it's uh, just a wide variety. Uh, but not letting the process get in the way of the decisions, the actions, the things that impact people's lives, um, I think is incredibly important, and I think it's something that we can all talk about today. So uh, I'll hand it over to Nahi. Before I do, uh, I, I wanted to mention uh, Ahmed Maui, who's here with me today. Uh, he's working on a project called SIFDEC, uh, which is uh, a platform for uh, media monitoring and helping people kind of carry out these types of activities in a way that um, informs them of risk of operations. So what are the threats in your value chain of operations and how can you mitigate that? Thank you very much. Okay, hello everybody. So I'm Anaya Yala Yakuchi and I work for an organization called Internews. And um, every time I put the logo into my slides, they give me an increase in salary, so just enjoy it. Um, Internews is a media development organization, and I have to be honest, the first time a year ago, my boss came to me and said, oh, you know, this is gonna be the year of data, we wanna work on data. And I was just coming out from being in Central African Republic for a month, living in the jungle and eating manioc. And I look at him, and in my brain, it was kind of like, 
really? Data? What, what does this has to do with me, with my job, with the communities we work, with the radio stations, with the journalists that have a radio that is powered out of a solar panel and broadcast two hours a day? And so I started to think about it, and I was like, okay, data, okay, what does data and big data means to me? What is that we're really talking about? Because a year ago was more or less when everybody started talking about it, right? Like, you could see in the newspaper, and there were graphs and charts, and, and everybody was really buzzed about big data, big data is going to change the world. And I was like, okay, so what is really big data about? And I started thinking about it, and I realized that really, Big data is not about data at all. And, and the reason why I'm saying this and the way I want to explain this is by telling you what is big data to me, right? Yesterday there was a very interesting panel about Westgate. And a lot of people are doing a lot of analysis about Westgate, what happened in Westgate, and all the data that was generated in Kenya, you know, Twitter feeds and all this kind of stuff. And so I thought, you know, when I'm looking at those pie charts that, you know, uh, Patrick was showing, what is that I'm thinking about? What is that I'm seeing in those pie charts? And so this is a friend of mine. His name is Ravi. And he lived in Kenya for a couple of years. Um, I met him through another friend, and we had been going out and having drinks together. And he's just a guy that really enjoyed having fun, as a lot of us. And one Saturday morning, he woke up, and he decided to organize a barbecue at his place. And so he went out of his house and went to the supermarket to buy food for the barbecue and inviting some friends over and have fun. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes things don't go the way we think they're going. And that day was exactly two months ago. It was the 21st of September. And the supermarket was inside the Westgate Mall. And uh, uh, Ravi died in, in that accident or in that attack. And uh, my point here is that when I look at those pie charts, the graphs, the big data, the analysis, what I see is Ravi's story. I see him, I see his family calling from Trinidad and asking where he was and trying to find out what was happening to him. I see me and a lot of other friends setting up a Facebook group to coordinate and look for, you know, the Red Cross list of victims and trying to get, you know, in front of the Westgate to see who were the people that were coming out. My point is that big data is about the individual stories of people that are affected in their life by humanitarian crisis. And it's important that every time we look at that data, every time we look at the pie charts, at the graphs, at the awesome maps that we produce, we really think that all those individual points that in numbers of millions make the data big are individual stories of people, the way they are affected in their lives. And we don't have to forget that because sometimes pie charts and graphs look very nice. But behind it, there's something that we need to explore a little bit better, maybe. So big data, in a way, it's relevant to me as a person that works with journalists and with media, not just because of the stories, but also because of the process. When we're talking about big data, we're talking 90% of the time about information exchanges, right? We're talking about information exchange over Twitter. We're talking about information exchange over email or over mobile phones. And so what we're really talking about is the process of generating and exchanging knowledge in between different people. And so really one of the ways in which we have been looking at that is what we call information ecologies, which means where does the big data fit into the way we communicate on a daily basis? So what we're talking about really is who are the people that we trust? Who are the people that we communicate with? And what are the channels that we use? Are we using only Twitter and Facebook? Do we use mobile phone? Do we go into the market and talk to other people? That's also a lot of data, right? But also we are looking into what is the resilience of those systems? For example, if the internet went down when Westgate was happening, how would Kenyans communicate? how they would have adjusted to the new ecosystem they were living in, what kind of data they would have generated. The second, actually the third question is, how big is really big data? And here I really wanna go into the humanitarian context 
because we have been talking a lot about how to use big data in humanitarian crisis, and we're kind of focusing a lot into what kind of knowledge and understanding of crisis we can get when we look at this data being analyzed. But the truth is that big data should also be used to underline the non-existent data. Those are some of the biggest crises that happen in this year. And to be honest, yesterday I was checking online, there's no big data about it. There's no fancy map, no DHN activation, no standby task force, you know, scraping, no big charts of Twitter feeds and Facebook and nothing at all. Those crises do not exist in the big data world. But they still exist, right? They still are there. We're talking about 4.6 million people today being affected by the war in Central African Republic. This is data that it's not there. And so when we look at big data, we should also think about the one that it's not there, the one that we're missing. The other one is the fact that when we are looking at all this kind of knowledge that is being produced online, we also need to think about the fact that people use the same tools in very different ways. And so just analyzing what it, com <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> what it comes out of those tools is not the same thing than thinking about how people are actually really using those tools. I give you an example. When I went to Chile, uh, it was uh, immediately after the earthquake. And it was after the earthquake that happened in Haiti. And we set up a Ushaidi platform, as you know, Fletcher School did in Haiti. And we had an SMS system set up. And we were waiting for thousands of SMS to come in. And I think that by the second month of monitoring and trying to get information out of Chile, we had something like 15 SMS in that platform. And we were asking ourselves, what's the problem? Why people do not you know, text to us? The, the mobile network is working. Everybody has a mobile phone. And then we went to Chile, and I talked with a friend of mine, and he said, no, 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 no. People in Chile, they don't like SMS. They call you. Even if it's a call of 30 seconds to tell you, I'm coming, they call you. They don't use text. They have it. It's a functionality. They have phones. They have a network. They just don't use it. So that's another thing that I want people to think about. You know, sometimes we just collect the data because we're used to think that that is the data that is relevant to us because we use that specific tool like Twitter in a certain way. But in other countries, people maybe use it in another way and we need to understand that. We need to give it a context. And then the last question is, what does really happen with this big data? I mean, we have now been analyzing and providing humanitarian organization with amazing, again, charts and maps and infographics and fantastic analysis, but is this really having an impact? I mean, the point is, do they really know what to do with it? Are they really able to use it to make better decisions? Is this data coming back to the population on the ground and make their life better? Because that's the whole point, right? Like, we're doing all of this because at the end of the day, we want to have an impact. We want people on the ground to have a better life. We want humanitarian organizations to take better decisions to address those problems. Is this really happening? Are we measuring it? Is this data useful? Are we teaching how to use data, li data literacy? Is that something we're really talking about? And so my last point is that Big data is great. I love it. I'm, I'm actually getting into it. I understand why my boss wanted us to work on big data a year ago. But I also realized something else. I realized that big data without the context and without an action that comes out of that, it's nothing. Big data as it is, as data, doesn't mean anything. We need to place it into a specific context and we need to be able to trigger an action that makes people take different decisions when they are on the ground, both humanitarians and the local population. And so what we need is that we need to provide them with the relevant information. And since I truly believe, and Internews as organization truly believe that information saves lives, I think that big data can save life, but we really need to have in mind all those, you know, different and specific issues that we need to address when we're looking at big data. Thank you. All right. Um, hi. Uh, good morning. So, um, yes, my name is Manuel, Manu uh, Le Touze. Um So I'm going to talk to you about, actually just ask four questions. Um, yeah, so four questions on the, um, 
<clears throat> on the sort of like big data rich future of humanitarian assistance. Um, I'm not a humanitarian expert, not understood as a humanitarian assistance, uh, but I've worked on the, in the field of big data and development for um, a couple of years. So the, the, so the title seems, uh, sounds a bit, I don't know, ambitious and, and perhaps borderline pretentious, but actually, so the reference is this article by Gary King, um, ensuring the, the data rich future of the social sciences. So it's just uh, like, you, you know, some reference to that, to that, to that article. <clears throat> so the four questions, and I can't really see them, so, oh no, I don't need to have the question. All right, so the first question is just, uh, and the nice thing about coming last is that a lot of this has been sort of uh, covered and I, and I you know, agree with um, a lot of the perspectives that have been presented. Um, so I just want to make like three uh, quick points about so, like what is big data and what more specific what it's about and what it's not about. Um, so the, f the first thing is that um, I tend or we tend because this is something that we wrote in a paper so with um, uh, Patrick Meyer and Patrick Vink about big data for conflict prevention uh, earlier this year. Um, we, we distinguish between big data as data and big data as a field and we actually use you know, caps or non-caps to distinguish uh, both concepts. So as data, uh, to me really big data is, um, so is like three things, but in general it's like the, the digital translations of human actions. Uh, so, so these are essentially non-sampled um, data uh, that, that can be grouped into three. So one are digital breadcrumbs, so it's like the structured hard data about, so credit card transactions, cell phone data, so call detailed records, uh, that, that sort of stuff. The second set um, is more social media, online content. And the third is more uh, sensors. So remote sensing like satellite images or uh, like, you know, smart meters for electricity usage, for instance. And of course, there are many ways, um, you know, John had so like a different typology. There are many ways you can cut, you know, these slices. And not everybody agrees on so like a definition or what is, you know, what big data as data, um, and, and, you know, encompasses. Um, some people have a larger um, con you know, conceptualization of big data, but this is so like um, mine. So it's all these new kinds of data that you know come out from people's lives as you use digital, as we all use digital uh, uh, devices. So that are picked up by digital devices. So, so the, the second thing is that. Um, is that I don't think, and, and, and as a result of that first conceptualization, I don't think personally that big data is about size. Very small data sets can actually be extremely uh, valuable and, and, and novel. Uh, and so I think the, the, if you ask what it is about, what is the novelty, what is the challenge, I don't think it's so much about size as it is about this, this, this qualitative shift, the different, different nature of, of big data. Um, understood as these, so like, you know, digital transla uh, tr uh, translations of human actions. And then, as Anahi said, um, I don't think big data is about the data either. It's about an ecosystem about the data. Just as much as, and it's actually Gary King who said that, so I think it's, we can so like, you know, listen to that. Um, it's, it's, um, it's really about, um, it's really about the, the so yeah, so the ecosystem, the analytics, and the people, the intent and the capacity, as uh, Kentaro Toyama uh, you know, says. Um, about using the, the, the for using the uh, the, the, the data, um, and so really when I hear or when I read, um, you know, the the, the 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 revolution is not big data; it's small data. I think it's a bit of a moot point because it's it's actually big data is just the sum of many 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 small data points that just add up over very long tails of uh, people and, uh, and and sources. So I don't I don't really see. Uh, in a position here, and, and big data can also be slow data in the sense that if you have cell phone data uh, on a, like you know on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, there is some you know some value in that as well. And so here, this is just to, ex to give you an example. Uh, this is the movement of uh, an individual in Rwanda over four years, um, and this is not you know this this data file is not big, but it's just new. Like f five or ten years ago, there was no way we could have known what this individual. Um, was, uh, you know, how, how this individual was, was moving. So this is just like new data, and, and here it's small. Um, all right, so here, like, then the question is how will big data grow on age? Um, and this is more as, as data here. It's, this is not really as the field. I'll get into the field um, later, so this is more. 
So this is just the growth in cell phone data uh, over time. So the, the small circle is, is the volume of data uh, in bytes in, uh, in 2009, and then the big circle is the volume of data uh, in 2017, and obviously you see like it's, it's been multiplied by about a factor of 100. Um, and you can also see the, the, the growth between 2012 and 2017 by region, and, and of course you see that the bulk of the growth is, is happening in, in uh, developing regions. Um, here, this is something, I won't really get into that, but just, it's just a new way I'm, trying, I'm starting to think about the growth of big data. Um, I'm doing my PhD in, in demography, uh, so at, at Berkeley. And so this is, of course, you recognize an age pyramid. And in a sense, I think it's, it's useful to sort of use this analogy to think about the growth of data. Um, and in a sense, there are different, and, and I just want to, this is just like food for thought, uh, because it's, it, would be, it would take too long to get into like the actual implications, but uh, uh, basically you can see, in a sense, as you know, you know the, the flatter an age pyramid is, the, the, the faster the growth of that population. So data is like a population, except that it doesn't die, first of all, uh, or, or you know, the, 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 the mortality rate of data is actually very, very low. Um, as opposed to a human population, so there are very many implications that we, we can infer from this um, from this from this graph. And here on the right hand side, I will just say that maybe in, in 2020 um, there are data that that haven't been that don't exist today. Just like Twitter data didn't exist, you know, five or six years ago. Maybe or obviously there will be something new, um, new kinds of data uh, that we're not really um, ready for. Um, then how has or may so like big data be used or has been used for in human assistance uh, purposes? So these three categories are also categories that we sort of um, you know, put on paper in this big data for conflict prevention uh, paper with, so with, with Patrick and Patrick. So one is descriptive analysis, like you know a map, you just show what's happening on, on the map. The second is um, predictive analysis, and I think we've become pretty good at doing predictive analysis. And the third one is more diagnostics. And in terms of, in statistical terms, it's, um, it's, it's really about uh, causal inference. And I think causal inference is going to be like the next frontier in big data, uh, like in statistical machine learning. Um, I think this is really um, like a field that, that, that is underdeveloped and that will be developed in the, in the coming years. Um, I think I'll probably skip that. This is just a, a, like a small paper that I wrote with a, with a, a friend um, using cell phone data from Ivory Coast and trying to see um, you know, how patterns of you know, cold volumes would actually show in the data um, around a conflict event. So the red line is from, it's an ACLED, um, an ACLED from the ACLED data set. So the red line is just a conflict event and this is the call the, the, the number of voice calls around uh, the event, like all the cell towers around the event. And you can just see, like, you know, the sharp drop right before um, the, the violent event. Um, and then this, and this, this may be completely sort of like, you know, spurious correlation. It may be that the cell towers just went dead uh, around the same time. So I'm not claiming that we found, like, you know, a way of sort of, you know, predicting uh, the next crisis. I'll skip that because I have one minute left. Um, but during the, the, the discussion, I'd like to get to this slide maybe uh, because I think it's an important one. Okay, so then I'll end with sort of what I see as the, 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 the traps and priorities ahead or the traps and, um, and you know, lines of work that I think are going to drive uh, the, the, you know, the field in the, in the future. So you may call this risks and challenges, if you will, but I just thought that, that traps and works or whatever would, would be more interesting. Um, so in terms of risks, um, I mean, Sanjana... Um, I'll start with the, the, the third one, of course, confidentiality, privacy, uh, and security. And usually these terms also get, tend to be completed and, and, or you know, we put everything in the same basket and they're actually pretty different. I mean, privacy, it's not really a matter of privacy, it's more a matter of confidentiality. Um, and, um, so, and the fact that we know from research that CDRs can be, so cell phone data, for instance, can be de-anonymized, that it takes only four data points in a, in a cell phone data to actually identify someone. Um, so, yeah, like one more minute and then I'm done. Um, so, you know, you can read the risk of creating a new digital divide um, and the risk of, you know, dehumanization, de 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 democratization of decision making. You know, the, like, you know, the kill robot program is sort of like, you know, one of them, one of the 
you know, futuristic examples of that, of this risk. And this is the last slide. Uh, so in terms of you know, what, what, what is next, I see uh, three main things. So politically, uh, or priorities. Of, so this whole notion of you know, keeping you know, communities um, empowered at the center, it's been said many, many times, but I think there's really this risk of reversing a trend that we've seen in early warning systems from you know, decades, or not decades, like a decade, or let's, let's say five years, that could be reversed with, with big data. That's one. The second is really about devising legal and institutional frameworks for, for like responsible, and this has to be defined, but like responsible data use and, sh and sharing and analysis. Um, and some people are working on that. Um, and, uh, and lastly, in terms of theory and, and, and methods, or theoretical and methodological next steps, I see four things. One is to work on the sample bias correction. A, sem a bias, of course, big data is not representative, but a sample bi a bias is not problematic if you actually know the bias and you can correct for it. So I think the next frontier is, is to do more work in correcting for sample bias in big data. That's one. The other is, um, Implementing tools uh, for to ensure like more privacy or confidentiality. So there's like you know it's like the irreversible future. You can actually put a like a timestamp in the timestamp in the data. Introduce noise in the data to make it harder to de-anonymize. Um, I'll skip the third one because it's pretty pretty technical. And the fourth one is about more work on causal inference, which is not just predicting what's gonna you know, happen next, but understanding why it happens. So then you get into p-values, uh, confidence interval, and I think this is sort of like the frontier. And I'm not gonna go over that. This is, you can uh, see, see the, 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 the chart. It's sort of like a framework model that um, I'm working on with, with Patrick Vink on data sharing um, and collection. Thank you, I'm sorry, it was longer than seven minutes, but thank you. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Um, as expected, I think the panel covered uh, a number of interesting points. If I might take the luxury of uh, just uh, re-articulating some of the points that struck home. Also, there is a, the ICT for Peace Foundation has put up a Flipboard magazine uh, and a timeline on a platform called Tiki Toki that has, I think, around 250 resources on big data that I've been curating over the past year. Uh, that speak to some of the points that the panelists have articulated. There's also a really cool, interesting book by David Eggers, which is out. It's called The Circle. I it think it's on the bestseller of Amazon. Uh, I've read it. It's absolutely a fascinating read. It's been compared to Orwell's 1984, which I think is not an accurate comparison. But Eggers does paint a rather dystopic, dystopian world uh, where this company called The Circle, which seems to be in the fictional world, amalgamation of Google, Facebook, and Twitter put together, and the central protagonist, and how she evolves into this creature, this character of oversharing. Uh, it's, I think, a very interesting fictional novel to read that has real implications about the way we understand big data. Uh, John, I think we can add another V, and not just for purposes of alliteration. Uh, yesterday, we talked about uh, the problems of uh, ascertaining veracity uh, in an emergency situation around the generation of big data. So in addition to the three Vs that you had, volume and, and vector and, and, and variety, maybe also the challenge of finding out what, what's true and what's not. Anahi, I, I love your slides, and I think we need to talk about the rights perspective. I think it's so important, isn't it? I mean, who owns the data? Uh, is it the generation? Is it the generation point? Is it the individual? Or is it the, the consumer? Or do companies own it? And over the longer term, for example, I've been grappling with this hypothetical scenario that I think hits true to home in many areas. What if insurance companies get hold of data generated in the immediate aftermath of a humanitarian disaster, months, even years after it, and thereby go on to raise the premium for communities or individuals who they perceive to be at risk? What are the systemic ways in which we can have a sunset clause for these kinds of data sets so that they're not appropriated by other entities long after the original intent and purpose? And what are the kinds of protections we have around? I mean, as, as, as you both said, this is about individuals. It's not just about the aggregate. And I think that, that there are some interesting questions about data generation and the politics of big data and ownership and usage over the longer term. I like your term, the ecosystem and big data. I like to see it as an ecosystem. And I think the elephant in the room, in a, in a sense, is Snowden uh, and what big data means after the revelations uh, that we have all been privy to uh, that our respective governments are, are, are observing in all of what we do. 
uh, not just in the UK and in the US, but what it, is to, what, what it is to be alive in this day and age with the kinds of surveillance and monitoring uh, that in a sense is also a big data. Um, I know that uh, the questions, Patrick, are there any questions on Twitter? Uh, maybe we can start off with some of the questions on Twitter uh, and then we have, I think, around 40 minutes, so we have plenty of time for questions and I'm sure that there are many in this room as well. Do we have any on Twitter that we can immediately focus on? Yeah, just a second. I had it and then I lost it. Um, it was something to the effect of how can you make sure that big data empowers individuals over institutions? And this was by the Digital Humanitarian Network. But, sorry? It was by the Digital Humanitarian okay. Network. How, how, you can em how you can have big data empower individuals and not only institutions. Was that addressed at any one party or just the I panel? Think it was open to all. Okay. You want to take a crack at that? Yeah. Um, I don't know how you make sure that that happens. <laughs> I can tell you how we try to make it happen. And it's the idea that, you know, once you get the aggregated data, what you get out of it is basically what we call the intelligence, right? You put it into a context and you understand what that means. And then you bring it back to people. And the way you bring it back to people is that you link it back to their own personal stories. I mean, this is something that, for example, our Kenyan office has been doing a lot with the um, open data portal from, uh, from the Kenyan government by taking all the data related to health issues and visualizing and, and taking the data, sending the journalists out to find the stories behind the data and then come back with the analyzed data and bring it back to people and say, this is what it means. This is how the government is spending your money. Those are the causes, the root causes of the problems. This is what you can do as individual to change this. So I think that again, for me, big data really stays in the center of a circle, which is, you know, before you have the stories that, you know, aggregated becomes big data, you get the intelligence out of it, you understand what's happening, and then you bring back that understanding to the local communities for them to take actions and to really understand what are the best actions to influence decision makers. Uh, if I can add to that, so I kind of see that as being one part of um, a two-part process. Um, so you have the awareness, which Anahi just uh, spoke about, but then you also have the liter uh, literacy aspect, right? Um, so the thing about Snowden is he exposed people to things that they really could have known for the past 20 years, right? There's no secret that, um, so there's a secret what was uh, being done, but there's no secret that it was possible. And I think that was the best thing that came out of that whole um, uh, debate, uh, which is educating the public about what rights what privacies they're giving up, even when they think they are protecting themselves on Facebook or Google or Twitter or whatever, um, just by understanding the nature of technology or the data that they're uh, contributing uh, to, uh, data sets that they're contributing to. So I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, yeah, just a couple of points uh, quickly. So one is that, um, um, it also, it's not just a matter of the individual versus institutions, it's also which institutions, of course. Um, and just to take one example that I'm familiar with, um, I mean, national statistical offices in developing countries are institutions, but they're still, of course, you know, very much behind in terms of you know, leveraging or engaging with big data. Uh, they see that both as, as a threat and an opportunity. Uh, they're being told that they're going to be, you know, out of, out of work and, and won't have a job in 10 years because it's like you know big data is gonna uh, is gonna do everything that they that they that they've been doing for almost 300 years um, yeah so to go back to this like the digital divide or the new digital divide I don't think it's only between individual institutions it's also between different levels of institutions um, and um, and the uh, and the, the the other point is that uh, what empowering means, if the question was about empowerment, um, I don't think everyone will ever uh, be able to you know, do big data analytics, and I don't think that should be the, the, the goal, but it's more about uh, access. I mean, if you think, of, like food security is not, it's about access, uh, availability, and so on and so forth, and it could be a good analogy for, for you know, big data. It's um, to have access to the means of, of, of knowing. It's not just doing it uh, uh, yourself, but obviously that's getting it to the, to the individual level um, is one of the, yeah, the, the, sorry, the, the key requirements of making this like, so like a democratic 
data revolution, if you, if you want. I do have two children on the panel who are playing around with the clicker, so uh, while they figure that out. Uh, <laughs> Jen, go ahead. <laughs> I guess I'll be prov provocative here. Um, I just had a, a sort of a question and a comment, which is that one of my concerns here is there seems to be almost a fetishization of big data in the sense of what kinds of inferences we think we can draw from big data. It's sort of in 2010 at the Crisis Mappers Conference, we talked about how maps can lie, which seemed like an important point at the time because people know, they know growing up, you know, books can lie, don't believe everything you read, so maps you know, don't leave every map in front of you in terms of the interpretation you think you can draw from it. So I'm wondering what statistical inferences can be drawn, like you, Manu briefly talked about p-values and things like this. What, what do p-values even mean in the context of billions of events, everything's gonna be significant from at least a, a, a novice's understanding of how statistics work. So it just seems like what I worry about is that people will just sort of I don't know, accept it as almost like this holy thing. Well, like big data tells me this, so therefore it's true. I'm not saying we shouldn't look at it, we shouldn't take it seriously, we shouldn't analyze it, but we have to somehow like get our minds back in this critical space where we say, but let's look and see if it makes any bit of sense in terms of on the ground, like what's going on. So that's my, I wondered, you know, how you think about these issues as well, each of the panelists. Before the, before the panel responds, is there anybody who has something to add to that particular point? I have three hands. Maybe we can go in that order. Uh, yeah, just, just to add on to, to, to Jen's comments, um, as, as to what big data will tell us, you know, it, it allows us access to censored information you know, snippets of information that might give us a sense for what is actually happening. But in terms, never mind even addressing causal inference, but valid descriptive inference, with this amount of data or this variety of types of data or volume of data, you're going to be able to find correlations that may hold, but in terms of learning anything mm. for the next situation, mm. you know, how do you get around that problem? Mm. Mm. I know, you had two questions over there? Um, uh, so I, I think there is, a, there is a problem with the way we're addressing the issue here. I think we're, we're addressing the issue with the assumption that we can use it right now, that we can just take a, uh, you, we can take CDRs and we can take this massive amounts of data and just reach our conclusions to it and completely change the way we do operations. We, we, you know, we react, we understand a situation, and that is not true. That is just simply not true. And my, I think if we address the issue from the point of view of being critical, saying we need to support research and development, we need to understand there's a lot here that could be used, and obviously we're so far, but you know, having that inclination to support research and development in a systematic way, be open-minded, and try to address that way, I think that we, could, we can probably uh, mm. you know, uh, uh, address it in a more constructive mm. way. So mm. my question is, how are you thinking about that? How are you thinking about linking the humanitarian community with the research and scientific communities to find, to understand, and figure out if these new sources of data, if these new methods are useful or, or not at all. I don't want to overburden, but was that point related, Jen? Or you had, a, you had your hand raised as well? Oh no, it was just you, okay, all right. You, you guys want to take a credit? Oh, she's still oh, you still have a question, okay. <clears throat> I'll just try to be brief here. Um, the two things I want to bring up in addition to kind of conversations around research and value and as we go forward is, are we using the right methods? Is a, uh, how we look at what we know as causation and statistics, is that the only methodology we should be looking at? And is there a methodology out there that we may not know or we may need, mean, we may need to find out ourselves and break the current methodologies? Are we assuming that that is the answer? And if so, why? Because I think that looking inward on challenging that assumption that I believe we think we have right now with big data, I think is going to be a valuable thing to explore. A frightening one nonetheless, but an important one to at least question ourselves for. Second thing is bringing back the data. Are we assuming that what we bring back is the end of the conversation? Or should that be the beginning of conversations with people who have provided the data, people mm. who may act on the data, mm. to have them revise mm. what we think we got out of it, mm. or do that together? 
Yeah. I don't think we should be making that assumption that it just gets brought back. That's the first and most important part of it, but the conversations and the revisions, I think, are really, really valuable. Uh, all, gear, all great points. Um, uh, to address uh, Jin's question, I think that, um, so there, there's not necessarily the implicit assumption that big data should be used for anything, right? Um, the, the first question when people come to me and they want to do a data project, my question is, well, why? What is the data for and, and why is it big data? And I'm just asking to play devil's advocate to see if they know what they're asking for, and usually they don't. And so I don't think it's necessarily fair to attack people for that, though, right? So uh, a few years ago, it was all about maps. People wanted to use maps. They saw them being very effective um, at doing certain things, or at least they thought they were. But at the end of the day, what they're trying to do is use new tools to do their work better. And so it's in their best benefit to understand the tool more effectively. It's more uh, beneficial to them to understand the methodologies more effectively. And so in doing big data projects, we all become more uh, educated about what big data is and what it means and what it can and can't be used for. There was a lot of questions about causality and um, correlations in data sets. And yes, you can get there, but but only once you understand the fact that the, the data doesn't, have your, doesn't necessarily have your answers, it has more data, and some of that data may be useful for your operations, and some of it may not be. But um, until people become more educated, there's, it's, it's impossible to, to prevent them from making those mistakes, right? Otherwise, they start using tools without understanding what they're doing, and that leads to, to bigger problems. So I actually really enjoy the fact that this space is experimenting more and more with new tools, new technologies, and new methodologies, new, question, new ways of asking questions about the world around us. Uh, because again, it's, it's all about helping them uh, hone in on what the best solution for their operations or practices. John, before that, I'm going to abuse our friendship and I'm going to ask you a question about SIFTEC. Yeah. Now, you, 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 you had a presentation and slide on that. In response to the question as to whether this should be a conversation starter with those actually who produce the data, what in SIFTEC facilitates that conversation? Or is it the case that as an entrepreneur, you are putting out a project that in you know, like 101 other entrepreneurs uh, is just another product on the marketplace? So yes and yes. Uh, the, the purpose of SIFDEC is to help people ask questions that they didn't know to ask. So it's all about uh, giving the system indications of what might concern you, what might uh, be relevant to your business, um, and then it starts feeding you information that are uh, trends, um, influencers, things that, that you didn't know to go looking for. And, and that's really the thesis behind the project. And uh, it's very much led by Ahmed, who uh, lives here in Nairobi. Uh, and we started brainstorming around it after, you know, as many people started thinking about new things after, after Westgate. And it was, to be honest, it's really thinking about the people who live here, who weren't there, but whose business organizations, operations are affected by something that for the first 24 hours, no one could really definitively give them answers for. So where do they start looking, that's what SIFTEX kind of pointed at. Do you want to answer? I can do it. Okay, so um, two things. One is, um, I mean, and, and John mentioned this before, is like data literacy. You know, when we are looking, you know, at the, the data, do we understand what we're looking at, right? Do we know what the baseline is? Are we asking the right questions when we are looking at the way this data is analyzed? Do we know anything about what are the preconditions behind the way this data is analyzed, right? I've seen once, I will always remember it, a graph that was drawing a positive correlation in between the consumption of hamburgers in the US and the wars around the world. And, and it was, it was, you know, a, a data scientist that was trying to show to people and to say, really, for us that are data scientists, we can tell you every, everything we want with the data. You need to learn how to read it because you are the only one that can actually challenge it. 
And so, and that's part, for example, of what we do with our journalists, which is to try to, you know, teach them a little bit of statistical analysis, to being able to make sure that whenever they are in front of whatever type of analysis, they understand what are the right questions to ask. And the second thing about methodology is, um, I definitely agree with the fact that, uh, actually, I have to say, I don't think this big data should be either the beginning or the end of a conversation. I think that it's, it should be part of a much broader conversation. And, and the broader conversation is also about the fact that when we are collecting data to do data analysis, basically what we do is that we are asking a question, right? But we only ask questions when we think that we know what we don't know. The truth is, we don't. We never know what we don't know. And so we have to start observing much more than asking, right? It's all the principle of human-centered design, the idea that you know, we, we should probably stop asking questions and just trying to observe and drive intelligence out of it. And that's one of the methodologies. And I think that, that, I mean, I think that all of us in this room are probably you know, trying to answer to those questions, which is, what are the ways in which we can do it better? You know, is this really relevant to us? Is this really changing the way we do things? Are we really able to drive any intelligence out of it? Um, yeah, so just a few, so a few points, because I think these are like super, super important um, questions. Um, all right, I mean, very smart people in academia are working on these topics, on these questions. So it's not like you know, no one has you know, thought about them. Um, no one serious claims that big data can do anything or uh, you know, will like, you know, change the words like, you know, magically. Um, Two or years ago, which is like, a, or three years ago, like, which is like a lifetime in the, in, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the field, there was this hype about, you know, the opportunity that, you know, this is going to change. And then there was like, so like the backlash, as always, you know, think again, you know, the bias, the, the et cetera, et cetera. You know, fine. Now this is phase three. Everybody knows, recognizes that, you know, so like the challenges, the fact that we don't know much or anything about how we can use uh, big data. This is year one or year two or year three of big data analysis. Statistics as a discipline has a history of you know, several centuries. Um, now the question is how is that discipline being changed by the advent of these new kinds of data? And of course the tools of statistics are super and the methodologies are super powerful, but they will have to be, I think, you know, challenged. Um, when I talk about like the frontier work in terms of causal inference, um, so someone like Daniela uh, Witten at the University of Washington is doing like super, um, super advanced work on um, on causal inference with um, with big data. Um, so this is clearly, clearly being done. No one claims that CDRs uh, you can get CDRs and do anything about them. Um, just like that. And there are two problems. One is actually to understand what you have in CDRs and how you can use them. And this is very, very, very hard. And we're just at the very, very beginning. Um, the other is that there is hardly any link between like this, the, the top tier scientific research done in the world using CDRs, for instance, and applications on the ground. I'll just give you one example. IBM research, um, uh, res IBM researchers sort of like showed, and this was in the press, that you could use CDRs to model and optimize bus routes in Abidjan, specifically. Very nice paper, great paper, super great minds. The problem is that I don't think the mayor of Abidjan has probably, you know, read the paper. Um, so then the question is like, okay, fine, you know, you claim that, but you know, CDRs can be used to model improve uh, bus routes. But this is done at you know, IBM or MIT or you know, Stanford, and it's not being done by you know, the people who have um, you know, any chance of uh, you know, changing anything about the outcome that is being discussed. Uh, but I mean, these are hard problems, and, uh, and we're very, very at the very, very beginning of, of just trying to understand this, this, uh, you know, this whole big data mm. hype. Patrick, we had a Twitter question. Yeah, one from Twitter from Jan okay. on Twitter. How can big data help improve transparency at the local government level, in particular right now in the post to the disaster situation, quote unquote post, uh, in the Philippines? So the role of big data for local government transparency in post disaster scenarios. Do you want to take, Anahi, you want to go with that? I mean, I have to be honest. Um, 
I don't think big data is really what you should use to improve transparency. I think you should use much more, you know, community engagement, local media. Uh, I think that that can improve transparency, to be honest. I don't see how big data can do that. Maybe it's just me. That's a good question for you guys. You're much more big data people. No, I, I actually agree. I, I think these are all tools, and when you start to learn when to use a wrench versus a hammer, you know, you're, you're making progress. But if you just start going out, you know, asking, you know, the question, is big data relevant in this scenario? Well, maybe, I mean, yeah, maybe. That's, I think uh, it depends on what you're trying to actually do and if it's really gonna help you. Um, in, the in, that, in that particular case, I think there's so many more things um, that people there have questions about. We had one question here. I see a hell of a lot of hands, actually. So we'll go with yours, actually. Um, I'm joining Jen and other people about the concern we can have uh, about the results of um, uh, <coughs> big data. Um, I would take, um, I would say, an upstream concern. Actually, uh, big data is about two things. It's all the data that it's so powerful now and uh, embrace every, every, everything in our lives. And how the process, uh, how does this data is processed. It's about algorithms. And for the moment in our lives, we are um, ruled by a lot of these algorithms that are, all of them, black boxes. Uh, I don't know if you read, there's a Frank Swain uh, article um, last uh, month about the fact that it's dance, dancing with silent algorithms. And uh, he's, a, he's a traveler, I'm a traveler as, as well. And when you withdraw uh, cash, for example, uh, you, you, have, you have problems because even you have your, your, your password and, and everything, actually there is an algorithm that we decide that, whoa, wh what are you doing? And it's, we, we, we are worried about that. So um, the thing is, it's okay, I would say, this is on, on the commercial level, we, we have to deal with that, but I think in the maritime world, uh, we, we need to have very transparent uh, algorithm. And my question is, actually, if there's a way like this, is I, these algorithms as discussed uh, at the humanitarian level, or I would, uh, either, um, maybe the risk like private companies will provide, I mean, big data analysis and results that should be, I mean, uh, directly uh, addressed to the field without knowing how it has been processed. I mean, what are the algorithms? Okay. I think, with your permission, can we take two questions and then come back to you guys, yeah? Um, at the back, though, sorry, there was a question at the back. Is that still relevant? You had your hand raised, yeah? Or you, you want to pass, or you want to ask a question? Well, it's, a, it's a comment. I think I'll wait till after the answer. Okay. Then I, sorry, I, there was some, yeah, you can go ahead. I saw your hand. So, I'm gonna, ask about the actionability of the data because all the computing methods, all the data, uh, this whole thing should be for solving a particular problem per se. So when we are trying to understand the problem and here we are saying that we will use big data to solve a particular problem. So in that, how do we define the actionability or the needs? This was one of the problem we were trying to do uh, why even the hangout here in this community from past two months to understand in this community that's what is really actionable data. You know, then we can go about approaching like this whole big data and build technology to yeah. really extract out those actionability. So how do we go about understanding those actionability needs in this, this space? Very good. We have a question about uh, the lack of transparency on algorithms, uh, and I think it's a governance question. We have how to figure out actionable data. We'll take one more question. Uh, the lady at the back, please, thanks. Um, my, my preoccupation is actually the countries that uh, Ayana raised where which don't show up on the big data radar. Because if we're talking about big data for humanitarian needs and protracted crises, these are the areas that we should be most concerned. These are the areas that are drawing the humanitarian resources. Um, so my question is, uh, what factors um, would help 
to make big data available in those in many mm. of those countries mm. because in many of you know we've talked in during this conference a lot about twitter a lot of internet based technologies okay there is in many of those places sms working satellite phones working what what would make that data available because when we come to look at you know basic things food security monitoring health monitoring etc that's the sort of information that we need where we can't get surveys on the ground or it's too insecure so it's really a question out there, how does this community facilitate Absolutely. that, or what are the factors yeah. that would help make it available? I think three fascinating questions you want to, um, in any particular order. Um, happy to, to dive in. Um, so the first question and the second question I think are actually related. So um, he asked about um, the, the trust people have for algorithms. And uh, there, it is often the case that this uh, kind of algorithmic work goes on in a black box. Um, but it doesn't have to, right? Uh, so that's why many of the tools that the people in this room use are open source, because you can actually see what algorithms are being used. And then the question becomes, uh, to the second guy's point, um, do you trust this algorithm? Do you trust this process to make a decision? That's why I use the, the kind of three hemispheres of uh, qualify, quantify, and uh, query. Um, the Qualification is the, the part where you make a decision. We have the data, we captured it, it's as big as the biggest data we could possibly find. Um, are, we, are, we gonna, are we going to change people's lives based on these results, yes or no? And that is um, something that I don't think an algorithm can tell you. It can inform you, but it's not gonna make the decision for you. Um, and then to the third person's point, um, I actually think the, the, the bigger data problems are the ones that, uh, about capturing data that we don't have yet. Um, and that makes Africa an, a really interesting place to do this type of work because it, it's one, the most relevant for all the reasons she listed, uh, but two, it's, um, it's a, a direct correlation between, you know, the, the development goals we hope to achieve in using these, these new, um, new ways of trying to achieve them, I think is something that uh, is, is, is important. Um, I think capturing the data, finding ways of getting people, citizens here, participating in creating data that uh, can be used for their benefit is something that many people are working on. It's, uh, but at some point it goes beyond data and it becomes about infrastructure and that's something that will be a longer challenge. Um, you know, there's just many more, much more ground to cover and, and many more um, barriers that aren't related to uh, distance. Uh, so I, I should say not tactical pr uh, challenges, but uh, there's cultural challenges, there's uh, um, literacy and the language sense challenges, there's um, uh, political challenges to getting uh, people participating in this process so that data can be used on their behalf. But it, it doesn't mean that there aren't ways of doing that and there's plenty of ways that people can participate in sharing information with one another uh, without having technology. Uh, uh, the thing that comes to mind uh, for me is uh, there's a gentleman, I believe here in Nairobi, who runs uh, um, this dashboard of farming prices on a chalkboard. Um, that's useful information. Um, to, the, to that community, that is incredibly valuable data mining. Um, and that's something that's actionable, it's relevant, and it helps them live their lives better. And so it's no different than having something like, um, you know, a Hadoop or a SIF deck or whatever you want to throw at it. It's the tool that gets the job done. Um, all right, so uh, make a general answer to like try and cover the three, the three questions. Um, so in terms of like this, you know, algorithmic world that we're living in or so like going towards. It's true that it's, um, it's a bit of a black box, in, in, but in, so in two respects. Um, one is that, at the risk of <laughs> repeating myself, these algorithms usually are predictive algorithms. I mean, they'll tell you that you know, Amazon works on that, or you, they'll tell you, you bought A, B, and C, so you're likely to buy D, um, and uh, we'll put you, uh, you know, an ad, and, and we're hoping that you'll... Um, but in a sense, th this in itself is a black box, because you don't really care why you know uh, buying a b and c will 
tell you based on other purchases that that people make why you're likely to uh, to buy uh, D. So this is so, and again, this is a predictive problem, or this is a prediction problem. But then if you move to again to like you know the inference, which I which I think is again the you know the the, the frontier in the field. Um, then, then the question is really to sort of you know unpack what's in the what's in the in the black 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 box. So that's one aspect of these algorithms being black boxes. The other is actually to so like you know open up uh, the you know the, the processes and the codes and the, and the algorithms uh, themselves. But it's it, this is more like an institutional, if you will, uh, or or like, so like structural uh, question. It's not a theoretical question. So black, it's, it, these are black boxes in these two respects, theoretically and institutionally, or or sort of even like um, legally. Um, the other point is that there is no actionable data. Uh, there's uh, only so like you know actionable information or actionable like knowledge. So you, you know the data needs to be of course you know collected first, um, you know so like analyzed, and then the question: What do you make of that analysis? Um, and I'm not sure to go back to the so like the, the triangle that that I, I showed that. Uh, um, I mean there are of course trade-offs between how much data you know, so like should be collected, um, should be shared. Uh, should be analyzed, so it's it's um, um, yeah. I mean, I I I don't want to live in a so like in a world where where all data is collected, is is you know shared, analyzed. Um, so the so the question is um, is also what's what's like the right balance, and the right balance is you know in great part determined by of course the use of it. So it's not like exogenous to that to the to the to the question. Of uh, you know how much data should be shared and um, and and collected, but uh, it, but in a nutshell, that I agree that so once we sort of like find the right this right balance, once we move away from only making predictions to sort of like more making inferences, these these are these I think increasingly these uh, these are going to be like very short terms like feedback loops where you try and assess so like magnitudes of impacts to different parameters. Um, and 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 this is going to be revised, you know, over 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 time. And you need people on the ground to actually tell you what you need to be working on. Question, maybe well, uh, in particular, but maybe you have a yeah. Response. Well, I, I just want one very quick about algorithms, um, which is um, the fact that I've actually having you know I'm not very tacky person. It took me like a week to understand what an algorithm was. Actually, you were the first one that explained that to me years ago. But uh, my issue is I don't, I'm not necessarily that interested in how the algorithm works, but I'm a huge fan of ownership of data. I want to understand what kind of data you're taking from me that you're using it. And if that's my data, you should ask me. And ask me doesn't mean that I say, I agree with the term of reference that I don't understand because it's written in a language that nobody can understand. I want exactly know what kind of data you are collecting. And I can say, great, go for it because I can have a better service. Or I can say, no, that's my data. I want to keep it. And, and so for me, the, the issue about the algorithm and not knowing what are all the multiple algorithms that we have in our machines that collect this data, it's, it's very important about that. Um, the other thing is about the actions. And again, I go back to the comment that I um, did to Jan before, which is, um, you know, it's the idea that, um, you know, we shouldn't be using big data as the only base of our actions. In any case, even if we have the perfect algorithm, again, it's the context. You know, big data is one stream of data, is one piece of the puzzle. There's a lot of others. And when we're looking at humanitarian emergencies and making decisions in humanitarian emergencies, it's already difficult even without the big data. I mean, more or less data, it's always going to be difficult and it's always going to be challenging. And probably we're always going to do mistakes and take the wrong decisions. That's, that's how it is. That's how it works. And you keep trying and you keep figuring out what's the best way to do it. Uh, on that, on the last question about how to make, you know, those countries that I mentioned part of the big data discussion, there's two things to me. One is that, you know, um, Emmanuel did a very good, you know, kind of like framing of the issue at the beginning, saying what is big data, right? And what we're talking about is digital traces. You know, we're talking about credit cards, we're talking about mobile phones, we're talking about internet use. In Central African Republic, as an example, only 30% of the country is covered with mobile towers. 30% of the country. 
That means that 70% of that country doesn't exist digitally. There's no mobile phone, there's no SMS, there's no internet, there's no credit cards. So that, it, there is big data there, it's not digital. You walk around, we take a car, walk around or, you know, and talk to people. <laughs> and that's how you collect that data. If you aggregate it, it may be big or small, I don't know, but that's what gives you intelligence. So one thing, again, is the differentiation in between, you know, are we talking just about the content, if you want, of the data, or are we talking about the means by which we collect the data? We need to think about not everybody has those means. And so we, you know, one way to put those places on the big data, you know, framework is to wait until there is, a, there is an infrastructure there. And the other one is to understand that there are different ways to collect data, and we should still be using those uh, you know, on the same side where we're using, you know, algorithm and all this kind of fancy technologies. Patrick, you had an outcome. I just two, yeah. two quick comments and then over maybe to, to Heather. First of all, one thing to keep in mind with, with big data, it's, it, big data capture is often or typically opportunistic. We try and, we try and collect as much as we can, Absolutely. and as a result, the principle of informed consent goes straight out the window. We're just harvesting, 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 and informed consent is just thrown out the window. That's really, really problematic. On the point about algorithms, in conversations I've had with private sector companies that are involved in, in big data analytics and data science, the algorithms, the classifiers are becoming more valuable than the data. They don't care about the data. As long as they have the machine learning classifiers, that's the, the, the added value for them, the intellectual property. Uh, so, so it's both data and I wouldn't just discard the algorithms, that those are becoming key as well. Just wanted to add that, thanks. And Patrick, I mean, in terms of informed consent, I mean, what do you inform, you know, give consent to on an informed basis? You know, after a humanitarian disaster, it might be informed consent, uh, uh, consent to give you aid, but over the longer term, do actors then go back to them and then say, can we use this data for other purposes? So informed consent over the long tail of the data generation is also problematic, isn't it? I mean, it's a complex problem, you know. Well, you know? just to add to that, there's a, there's a very interesting project. I think it's called Open Path. And it's, an it's a mobile application, you install it on your phone, and it collects data about your movements, right? It's uh, GPS coordinates and so on. But it's very fascinating because you, you basically subscribe and create your account, and researchers can go on the website, can log in, and can basically, if they want to use your data, they send you an email, and you get this email that says, hey, we're two researchers, we work in this university, this is the research that we're doing, we would like to use your data because of this, this, and this, and this is the kind of, you know, things that we're going to try to infer from this data, everything is going to be anonymized, and so on. They explain to you what they're going to do with your data, and you can tell them, yes, great, take it, use it, or no, thank you very much, I don't want to give you my data. And I think it, to me, is a brilliant project because every time I've got it, I, I read it and I go through it, and I'm like, oh yeah, I like it. I, you know, I can give you my GPS location and it, it's not a problem for me, but they inform me about how this is going to be used. Just to quickly add to that, uh, so Jer Thorpe, who's behind the Open Path Project, was a Bellagio Rockefeller Foundation fellow, and we had this exact conversation, how do we take this kind of data commons governance to the humanitarian development realm? And so there's a paper that uh, was just released a few weeks ago, entitled, and it was tweeted as well, uh, let's see, um, uh, big data uh, and ethical resilience for community projects, and we're bringing that into. So that's informed consent, that's beautiful, I like that. Came in. Heather? It's on. Good morning. Um, I was at the Open Gov Partnership. Heather, can you come close to me? I'm tired, so I'm a soft talker. I'll speak up. So um, I was at the Open Gov Partnership uh, Summit, and so all these countries have signed up to be able to open up data, and it was really an interesting conversation with the folks from Nigeria, uh, Budget IT, and Reclaim Naja. And what they really said, I just want to build on what Anahi was mentioning, and it's not really a question, more of a statement, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more about CAR, that um, they don't trust the way that the government's data is being published, um, and that, that they, if they want budget information, if they want to use open spending, which School of Data does, or, or anything like that with OKF, that they actually will go and collect it. And the collecting of the data has to be done by the citizens, and that we need to think about. And while researchers are going forward with all their methodologies and their discussions, and I think that's really important, what people on the ground are doing is taking citizen data, but in addition to that, trying to find structured data themselves. And so they're actually trying to parse from different communities all the different budget data from the little councils 
and be able to put it together. And so that to me was really illuminating in that they, they, they're thinking of ways to work around what we think are, like we, we have all our shiny open data portals, like we have that in Canada and everybody else and the UN and the World Bank and that's fantastic. But the idea of these local communities taking the initiative and driving that, that was really exciting for me, but it was also really scary because of all the privacy discussions I've had. So is there any, I'm kind of thinking about like, how do I help those people with the school of data? How do I help those people get the data sets they want to be able to collate and do that? And and so whether it's research methodologies or techniques, I think that's a gap um, to fit somehow. We had, do I go in? Actually, you can, yeah. can the panel ask questions? The panel can ask questions as well. Can the panel ask questions? Yeah, yeah. So um, we're, we're sitting at the UN, um, or one of its many, many uh, locations around the world, and I'm curious to know whether it's from the panelists or people in the room, if anyone's aware of um, efforts to make data policies, um, you know, multinational policies globally, uh, because this is increasingly um, becoming, whether we want to or not, a globalized world uh, through our data, but right now, Right now, to be frank, that data is disproportionately controlled by a handful of countries and a handful of corporations within those countries. And so I'm just curious. We'll leave answers to that, but there were, there was, there were two questions. Yes, please. So it's, it's really more of a comment. Um, I really appreciate this panel and digging into a lot of the conceptual ideas behind big data and a lot of the questions that we don't usually ask. Yeah. It's very illuminating for me. Um, but as someone who works in a large formal humanitarian organization, this whole panel is almost entirely moot simply because I'm trapped in an infrastructure that is so outdated and the access to tools that I have is so limited by policies that are concerned with security that the notion of big data for me is sort of a, a curious thing that exists off out on the side. Um, I know that one of the things that USAID is trying to do is fund more research and fund more outside entities to do this. But maybe a little bit to, to Luisa's point earlier, I, I don't know uh, if, if we can really use this at all. And I think that those of us in formal organizations are really quite limited in, in even considering this mm. thing that we call big data. Mm. The most useful uh, definition of big data that I've ever heard is a data stream that is so large that it breaks down customary methods of, of processing it. Um, I, I have a problem even using an Excel uh, table with more than you know, 50,000 records on it. So I guess two things. One, uh, just is there a consideration of that? Um, there's a community here that has radically different capacities and access to data and to data processing. Um, and is it possible that because of that, this is something that, that the community and that different universities and researchers, individuals could actually drive, could take advantage of the fact that institutionally somewhat, we're somewhat behind? So just a comment and would love to hear your thoughts. We'll take another question, actually, there was some, yep. Uh, it's not really a question, it's just to respond to what was just asked before. There is a United Nations initiative on global geospatial information management, so that might be an initiative that we could tap into there to address some of what you were saying before. Um, yeah, so about the last comment, I mean, I completely agree. That's why when I say, you know, it's like year one or two, um, this is just, uh, so like my, uh, as far as I'm concerned, like my thinking is more, you know, 10 years or 20 years, you know, down the road, but it's more about, you know, planting the seed and planting so like the right seed um, and, you know, since like, you know, watering it the, the right way and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, just to, but maybe I can pose a question. I mean, in adding on to that, is it, and also your, your case about the optimization of the bus routes. Even if the mayor does not comprehend or is not interested in that report, can a case be made that that is now in the public domain? In other words, is the use of, pub, uh, of big data uh, only imagined by those who have access to big data? Or, Anahi, can it be the case that communities who don't understand or have access to big data can nevertheless be presented with products that lead to informed interrogations of government, local government, uh, in that so that the, it is the big data that is informing the discussion, but it not, might not be the big data that is present in front of the desks 
kind of uh, you know uh, overwhelming them you know does that make sense and what what would your responses be to that and john please free, feel free to chip in as well yeah i mean so uh, I mean, just to answer the, your 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 point and and um, and and so like just on the on the the comment that was also just made um so i think i think like two main obstacles so one is that so the, 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 data the, the data computer and web science community on the one hand and the development and humanitarian community on the other hand are still sort of disjointed. I mean, this event and a few others are one of the few places where there's you know, really a connection, but still it's pretty, it, there, 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 there are quite a few, I mean, very few links. Um, that's one, and the, other, and the other is that there are indeed very few, so like, um, structural channels to bring you know, whatever these two communities would actually talk and do together to you know the the, the, the ground. I mean, I hate the term, but you know, just for you know, to, to simplify. Um, and it's true that it's. I mean, I go back to the example of a national statistical office. I mean, I was in, in Colombia recently, the Colombian in, in, in Latin America, um, and uh, I mean, not the university, and um, and the, and the director. Asked me how 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 should I to like go about d d devising a big data strategy, and it's the National Statistical Office of Colombia. I mean, it's a, it's a country that's about to join the OECD. We're not talking about the National Statistical Office of a you know a low, a very low income country. So it's true that it's just really really the, like the early early years, um, and I'm not really I'm not at all in the camp of those who say, wow, you know, this is the data revolution. We're gonna know everything. We're gonna do everything, and I think there are many scaries. I'm running out of time, so I want to get yeah, uh, Anahi and John as well. Um, just very briefly, uh, the answer to your question is yes, absolutely, in the sense that really you're not, you know, I, I don't know, maybe you can bring back to people the big data analysis, but really doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of people. What you want to bring back is the product out of it, right? Is, is you know, what does that mean for their life? Again, I mean, to me, and that's the reason why we work a lot with, with journalists in that sense, is the idea that that data will can give you an idea of something and then you know that is what you want to bring back to the community so that they can actually think about it and use it in a certain way i was also thinking about like institutions as as was mentioned that can't use it can it still be useful i, I well it is the the tricky point to me is you know it, it can be useful is again understanding the limitation and the context in which you want to look at it. What I'm really afraid sometimes is that if you don't have really the capacity to understand what you're, you have in front of you, you can make very stupid decisions out of it because you're not really understanding what you're looking at. So I would say yes, there is the possibility. I would be very careful, right? In between using it, not really knowing what you're doing and not using it, I would say, okay, no, don't use it. <laughs> Spend your time using something else and then you know work out your capacity in terms of being able to really understand what that means. And maybe, you know, getting to the same conclusion at the end of the day saying, really, that's not useful. I, you know, the rest of other stuff that I have and other type of data and stream of information are more useful than big data. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, to, to respond to your question from before about <laughs> kind of bringing products or, or appifying, um, you know, these uh, insights that are drawn from data sets. I think that's a good, uh, good use case, but to Anahi's point, it has to come with the literacy. It has to come with the, with the awareness that this is a system that may or may not be a black box that is telling me to do one thing or another, and I have to, to, be, I have, to have full confidence that if I'm gonna take actions based on this device that I'm giving that my decisions to this device, um, or I'm not, you know, that, that needs to be a decision. Um, uh, there is an, uh, just going back to your question to him about um, the traffic data, I, I've seen some interesting uses of that uh, kind of uh, practically. Um, here in, in Kenya, there's a, a, a startup called Mathritu or Mathratu or something um, that, that is, is essentially doing that. They're a startup. Um, you could do that in the, the, as part of a public group, 
um, which I think um, you know Ushahidi has tried many times, or people using Ushahidi have tried many times. But you know, having an uh, having a company that's doing that, I think, points to a bigger need for the public sector to work with groups that aren't necessarily companies, but that are thinking about sustainability. Right? That's the implication there. Here's a startup trying to do something that once was tried and didn't work as a uh, um, you know, not Ushahidi itself, but the, 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 the map about traffic, I mean, just didn't really work because it's, who's gonna keep it going, you know, long term? And so I think sustainability is really important to think about when it comes to these questions. I guess a measure of a panel's success is in how many questions it leaves behind. All three of the panelists are gonna be around for uh, the day and I think for some of the self-organized sessions tomorrow as well. I know that uh, Jen is organizing, I believe, uh, uh, a self-organized session around big data tomorrow. Don't know exactly the time, but these are discussions certainly that we can have and continue uh, to have virtually and physically. Thanks very much for coming in the morning and joining us on this panel. And I thank the panelists as well.